this is quite an opportunity for me, probably being the age of most of your grandparents. I came into the world in the height of the boomer generation, just after the Second World War. So I grew up in the 50s in the country with woods, fields, and it was always uh, part of my life was uh, being handy with tools. My father was a builder, and as kids, we were uh, his slave force, taking down old buildings, old barns um, that were falling down for the materials. So he was kind of ahead of his time in the 40s, recycling buildings, posting beams, getting those out of old buildings, as well as uh, bricks and that. I remember as a kid taking a chimney down from the top and throwing the bricks out on the ground before I got below the roof. And when I went to go pick up the bricks, I found a cannonball. Brass cannonball, like 17 pounds. It was from, I don't know when, but way before. That was a very significant memory for me as a child, finding a piece of history from a former period. So, doing that, uh, I, I, with my father and my brothers, three brothers, we got a lot of hands-on, I love that expression, hands-on. We have hands, they, they can do something with these. We, uh, we did a lot of building as kids, tree forts, tree houses, crafts, and that sort of thing. And I always drew as a, as a kid. I always liked to create things by drawing. So that got me started in my creative de development. I went through, actually I have to admit, 18 years of formal education. That's including a, a graduate degree, master's degree in uh, blacksmithing. I went back to school in my late 40s to get that uh, degree. And uh, the way I came to blacksmithing, as I say, I had all this education. I was trained to be an English teacher. I was taken by English by language, um, poetry specifically, and so at that period, after having been a, a painter, painting watercolors, oils and that, I got into poetry when I was at, well, you guys age, uh, junior high school and high school. And after a period of probably four or five years writing poems, I realized the poems were all saying the same thing over and over and over again. And a lot of it had to do about isolation. My poems were about people being isolated from one another. And it just seemed to be going nowhere. So I dropped being creative in the literary sense and um, continued my education. Uh, I was lucky enough to find a job at a summer camp when I was 15. And the chef kind of took me under his wing. He was a, uh, an old Navy chef. So he taught me everything about cooking, which was a wonderful skill to have because I started as a pot washer and two summers later came out with a wealth of, of knowledge about how to prepare food. Um, he was an institutional cook, so I got everything. Soup, soup sauces, baking, roasting. Uh, it was a wonderful education and just a practical experience to generate income, have labor, have, have a job. So I learned that early on. I had skills as a builder. So when I came to Walden, I came to Walden from having lived in four different states before. Uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and uh, Maryland. <clears throat> so I, I ended up finishing high school in Maryland. And at that time, it was still segregated. There was a black high school and there was a hi white high school. So you can imagine, it was, times were quite different when I was your age coming up. And when I finished, did finish college, a bunch of different schools I went to, um, I ended up, I had lived, this is like in the late 60s now, in the early 70s, I had lived on, in a couple of communes with people communally and had this idea about what the potential was for a combined effort to reach, to reach, to reach uh, goals um, in, in life. So when I got to Walden, it turned out that the population, I think in 1972, was about around 400. And when I got to Walden, all of a sudden, within a year, there were 40 of us people going, by the way, anybody have any questions? Don't worry, don't, don't, don't hesitate, Hang, put your hand up. When I got to Walden, there were 40 of us who had come here who were retreatants from mainstream culture, people from the suburbs, from the city, who wanted to go, quote, back to the land. And of all, all those people, I was one of the most fortunate in terms of the piece of land that I got. It was $200 per acre. 
I bought 40 acres of land with a stream on it for $8,000. That's less than a new pickup truck. And that land, being a woodlot, spruce, fir, and cedar, already had a, a, a marketable product. And this, as soon as I bought that land, someone came forward and they wanted teepee poles. And I had cedar on the land. So I had teepee poles. Right away, the land afforded me an income. And that led into my career as a logger, which led into having horses. I had a single horse that I would skid trees out with, make up a pile of wood, and then end of winter, sell it. And glean the best saw log for myself, because that was my material for building. Spruce, fir, cedar. Local, there's five local sawmills, I mean, within 20 miles of here, so it was perfect situation. As I say, the land was really, has been very good for me. It's paid for itself a number of times over, and the wood that I've sold, pulp, saw logs, and cedar for posts, uh, poles, and rails. So, I, a lot of people bought land because it was cheap, but they ended up, there wasn't much they could do with it. In my case, it was quite different. Right away, I had a market and I had a horse and I could get the wood out. Well, after a bit there, oh, in the early 70s, mid-70s, there was a, quote, energy crisis. And this was where the oil prices skyrocketed. And I all of a sudden thought, as a romantic, well, the heck with automobiles. I'll do it by horse. I'll do horsepower. I'll go to town on my horse and I'll do my uh, logging with the horses. And so I needed a vehicle to get to town in. So I made one. I made what's called a four cart with old car wheels, high diameter car wheels uh, from a 1930s car. It's a four cart, it's just two sets of a set of wheels behind the horse with shafts, so if the horse backs up, the cart's not gonna go anywhere. And so up to then I'd been just working my horses. Now I thought I was gonna use them for transportation. But it <laughs> didn't take me long to realize that there's such a thing as horse time and machine time. And if I were to go to town and do all my stuff with horses, it would be a lot slower. So I gave up that dream. But anyway, making that forecart, being handy with tools and that, I was starting to move metal. And one of the four carts I had in a parade in Hardwick, and does anybody know who Peter Schumann is? Peter Schumann is the founder of Bread and Puppet. He saw my forecart in the parade, and he had to have one. Because Peter had a little tiny donkey that he wanted to have a cart for so he could go up in the woods and get wood, come out with his, nut, his little donkey. His name, donkey's name was Ignatz. So I made him a cart, and, and that got me sort of thinking about there might be something here. Someone came through and saw the cart I'd made and suggested a craft school in Maine that had a course in blacksmithing. Because I say, when I built that cart, I started to move metal and shapes and forms for making the cart. And as I say, the result was pretty successful. I sold two of them. And uh, when I, in, in that process, I found out about this craft school in Maine that taught a blacksmithing course for two weeks. So I applied to the craft school. It's in Deer Isle, Maine. It's been in existence since the 40s. It's one of the older craft schools in the country. People study clay, they study fibers, they study blacksmithing, study glass. It has these workshops in the summertime. So I took a two-week blacksmithing course there, and I, I was this, like, I've had angels in my life. The instructor for the course was James Horobin, third-generation blacksmith from the West Country in England. And I'll talk about the rich and famous and celebrities later, but James Horobin actually changed my life. I had been a poet. I had been a painter, and here I found metal. I have steel. It's like, oh, I want to make poetry with steel. You know, I want to, I want to express what I know with with metal. You can see what you all know what these things are, right? So, with my relationship with James Horobin, I that was a two-week course. He invited. We we bonded right away. He asked me to come to England to help him on a project. And the project was this gate. And it was like 400 hours made by hand, everything shaped with a hammer and an anvil. And I ended up making 28 of these things. And typically in a gate or railing, it's to keep things out or keep things in. And in this case, these elements Instead of scrolls, they keep the rabbits from going through. 
but they're also decorative. And, and, and typical gates and traditional blacksmithing, these are all, all this filler is done with scrolls, just like, like a scroll, like a spiral. Horbin, James Horbin's skill as a blacksmith is design. I mean, he makes these things that looks like a creature, but it also looks like a plant. I mean, I was just blessed to have this person in my life. He started my fire. After that course, I said, this is what I've been looking for, blacksmithing. Well, it turns out, fast forward 25 years or something, I went over there to help him with a project. And he says, you know, we're in a movie. I said, what? He says, yeah, we're in Alice in Wonderland. I said, no. He said, Johnny Depp in Alice in Wonderland, in the movie, in the early part of the movie, it was filmed, that part of the movie was filmed on the Hasseltine estate. And the Hasseltine estate is owned by a very wealthy Britisher who is a huge piece of property and James Horobin has made him ten gates. This is one of them. This is the one that I helped him work on. So there we go. I looked, got the movie, rented the movie and there it is. In Alice in Wonderland, the Johnny Depp movie, Alice takes whoever her suitor is out away from the crowd of people to tell her suitor that she's not really into him, uh, she's not interested in having a relationship, and they're saying that that dialogue is happening in front of this gate. I'm looking at the movie screen, there's a gate we made. I just, what, what, I mean, life sometimes comes back to you in strange ways. So, anyway, as I say, we lived communally before I moved to Walden, purchased this land, there was a healthy woodlot, five sawmills, and I, Okay, and right away, as I bought this land, I had a market for the products. That was another blessing. Right away, it was a healthy woodlot that a logger had bought the year before and decided he was short on cash. So he sold the woodlot, and I was the one who was there. And as I say, it just, it's just been really very fortunate to have that, that situation. About the end of the uh, 80s, I managed to get Sterling College students, at that time they had a very strong interest in logging in the woodlot and I managed to get um, Sterling College students to come for 10 weeks as their practicum, as their, their, their experience of the world outside of school. And In this case it was, I call my place Watergate because it was conceived in the era of Watergate, Nixon's debacle in the early 70s so in my place has lots of water on it. So. I had blacksmithing at Watergate, horse logging at, at, uh, at Watergate. So I would have the students at Sterling College come, they'd be there for 10 weeks. I would give them lunch and uh, instruct them in logging with a horse and then blacksmithing in the afternoon. And that was a very successful program until Sterling changed their focus more to mountain climbing and hiking and the outdoors sports activities. So that program ended. But for over 20 years I've taught blacksmithing and something that's really interesting to me about, the, uh, about blacksmithing is it, it's where technology came from. The blacksmiths are the ones who made the tools, they made the weapons. And so when, uh, let's see, I lose my train of thought. When I got to uh, when I had the Sterling College kids, I realized I had, a, I had a, uh, something that I could do with the locals. So I put it out there and for over the years I've had students for a three, three hour sessions, so nine hours total at my place. This is the school at Watergate, BS 101. You learn the basics, how to move metal. And now as far as careers go, this goes more towards the creative focus than actually making money. I have done uh, commission work, I've done the metal work at the Buffalo Mountain Co-op, the signage there, got things around, but in terms of steady employment it's very, very hard. And in terms of if, if you guys looking out and looking ahead and looking at your future, possibilities for making it work, I can't recommend enough how important the trades are. If you don't have the means to get to college or uh, yeah, have a scholarship to get higher education, there is a lot of need in the trades for skilled workers. Electricians, plumbers, people who work with their hands, and I would say an addendum to that would be if you prefer southern climates, learn air conditioning. So I spent time in the sailor world in boats and I know in the Caribbean 
there's a lot of people with a lot of money who have air conditioning that need people to fix air conditioners. So there's another little sort of career tip. Other than that, I would say, phew, oh, where we got here? So, yeah, I told her. Yeah, yeah okay. So I, uh, to give you a perspective about, you know, from the beginning to now, when I first bought that 40 acres, my taxes were $118. And I had just moved on it with a wheelbarrow and a pup tent. <laughs> now I've got seven buildings <laughs> and my taxes are $3,400. Three of the buildings I rent. So there's low interest or low, a uh, low, what do you call it? Low income rentals is what I have. There's cabins with a wood stove and pump water. And between the cabins and the wood lot, the place has supported itself. It pays its taxes, gives me a little bit of income. So. I would like to say again, I've been very fortunate in the piece of land I've bought. There's a lot of people that were my contemporaries who bought land. It turned out being a millstone around their neck. They couldn't make any, any money off the land and it was more than they could deal with. They didn't have the equipment or the skills. In my case, everything worked for me and the place is self-supporting now. In fact, I've branched out in oh, the mid-aughts, like 06. Bought a building in East Hardwick, again, a steal. This building costs less than a new pickup truck. It's the old uh, East Hardwick uh, freezer locker. I turned it into an art gallery. Because over the years, I've been showing work, sculptures and the things that I've made, and trading with people. And I ended up with a good, sizable collection of paintings and sculptures and things. And I thought, well, I need a place for these. So that's what prompted me to buy that building. So Whitewater Gallery, has anybody heard of it here? Whitewater Gallery, anybody? Been there in East Hardwick office, the post office for 12 years now to showcase local talented people's work, which there are many. There are many locally talented people. And uh, that's what the, the gallery has done. And not only that, it's supported the arts locally, i.e. I asked for a 30% 30, 30 commission if someone sells a piece of work Usually in galleries, they want 50%. So that, that's an inspiration for people to have work there to show, because it won't cost them a lot when they sell piece, a piece of work. And I ask for donations as well. At the end of the summer, it's just from Memorial Day to Labor Day, at the end of the summer, I take what's come through the kitty as well as donation, as well as uh, commissions, and give it to the library, to Neck Arts, to the Grace Program. So it's like people's work, people's creative efforts, supporting other people's creative efforts in the um, in the uh, environment in the uh, community here. And it's not a whole lot to do now that I've got it up and running. I do have a docent who is a gallery assistant in the summertime, and that's an opportunity for youth employment Sundays, 11 to 3 for 40 dollars. Not bad to sit there and, and and greet people when they come in and tell them about the artists. So I've actually now got two fronts. I've got Watergate Forge, where I live, and I've got Whitewater Gallery in East Hardwick, which is three, three miles from where I live. So I'm at the point now where being off the grid and out of the box for 45 years or whatever, I'm planning to join civilization this winter by having that upstairs apartment over my gallery be my place to, where I'll be, that's where I'll be living for the, you know, that's where I'll sleep. I'll go up to work at the place every day, but that place has got push button heat and it's very cozy. So I won't rent that. And that's where I are, it brings me up to the present. So I'm currently, I've got Jonathan and uh, Zarian coming to the shop and we're in a, we're in a underway in a project to uh, build tools. And they've just been started, they've just started with me and it looks encouraging. Both of them are interested and, and do good work. So I'm in, a, I'm in a place now where I'd like to put the word out. Anybody who wants to learn about moving metal, I mean, all the boys want to make knives. All the girls want to make flowers. But that's fine. <laughs> I can show you how to move metal. And I would be glad to do that. Got any questions? Nada. Sir. Good question. Uh, thanks for sharing your story with us, first of all. Uh, it seems like, at least to hear you tell it, you picked up blacksmithing fairly quickly. Would you say people who are skilled in, in other trades, it, it's something where you can jump in and 
before too long has gone by, tell, you can make yeah, something. Yeah, I often tell kids, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of people have not had experience with tools and, and working with their hands. Um, and I often see kids, they, haven't, they don't know how to swing a hammer. Well, you don't need to swing it, throw it. You know, it's like a different, it's a different motion. And it's like those kinds of things. Uh, and the other thing, that Tennyson poem about the village blacksmith, uh, that, that's when you had to be a gorilla because you were shoeing horses with feet as big as a plate. Today, does anybody know the difference between a farrier and a blacksmith? People say, oh, blacksmith. Oh. No? Oh, blacksmith, you shoe horses. Ah, that's in the old days. The blacksmith did everything. Nowadays, a blacksmith does ornamental iron work or commission work in metal. A farrier shoes horses. And I found in my experience, when I was at graduate school, there were a couple of students who were, you know, re-entered the, the school system after being, black, after being uh, farriers. They wanted to learn blacksmithing in a serious way so that they could go on. And, and that's what led them to blacksmithing was working with horses. And that's the bottom line of, of my experience is like those horses, I learned so much from them, um, starting with patience, you know. Um, I had a couple of episodes where if the horse wasn't as smart as he was, I wouldn't be here now. And I, I really had a, 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 had a wonderful relationship working with them. And if nothing else, I say they taught me patience. And they also when they brought me to blacksmithing. And the other thing about blacksmithing that I love, the metaphor, of, is that every time you bring that hammer down to do something, to move metal, to make your shape, every time you bring that hammer down, it's doing something. Now that's all about life, isn't it? Every time we effect an action, it's doing something. So the point is, do something that works instead of something that doesn't work. Because again, in blacksmithing, when you go, when you, if, you, if you've made a mistake, you can't continue until you've corrected that mistake. And to me, that's just a wonderful lesson for life. You know, if you make a mistake, face it and move on. Don't just pretend it didn't happen because that piece of work will have a, a flaw in it. So, any other questions? Yes? Why does the turtle have wings? Okay, there's a good question. My son and I, I just thought, well, let's go. I, my kids live with my ex-wife. They didn't live with me, and I had them on vacations. And my son and I, we thought, well, let's go scuba diving. He likes to swim. I like to swim. So we went to Glover's Atoll, which is a place to scuba dive off of the uh, coast of Belize, Brit formerly British Honduras. And there I am scuba diving down maybe 30 feet, seeing a coral reef. And there's a green turtle sitting on a shelf on the coral reef. And I'm swimming along, and I saw it. I kind of paused, but the, the spooked the turtle, and it went like that. Like it was a bird. <sighs> I've been about turtles since I was this high. I mean, the turtle to me is like, he carries his house with him. I mean, that's, that's where it's at, right? So, when I saw the turtle swimming like a bird, I thought, well, that's a good idea. I'm going to put wings on a turtle. There's my, you know, because it was like, and it, you know, it works. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Wouldn't the turtle need four to actually stay up in the air? Say again? Wouldn't the turtle need four wings to actually stay up because it's so heavy? Wouldn't he what? Need four wings to actually oh, stay perhaps, up. Oh, perhaps, but he was in the water. You know, and he had his paddles. But yeah, I mean, you think of a turtle swimming, you think of him like a, like a loggerhead turtle, you know, kind of like laboriously getting through the water. This was like a bird. That's exactly the motion that that turtle had. So that's what I, that's what inspired that, that uh, you know, the wings on it. I showed you this. This is just a sculpture I did. I call this mentor. You know, he's kind of telling you like, this is the way it is, people. Sculpture. Here's a pulp hook, you know, what you use for moving material. It's roughed out. And then there's a pair. I have a cook stove, so this is what I use for putting, you know, arranging the fire in the cook stove. A pair of tongs. Questions? Any others? Yeah. Um, how long do you to make them? That's the problem. People don't understand now when they go to buy stuff how much it takes to make something by hand, how much time it takes. 
And I have a friend who's very successful. She's incredibly uh, skilled as a designer and builder. She's a sculptor out in Montana. And she charges $30,000 for a buffalo. And the buffalo is made out of junk. She goes to the junkyard and gets all this scrap metal and puts it together in the shape. And there, it's a buffalo. His heavy and big mane and everything is made out of chains. And it's like, it works. Well, she charges really high prices in her... her the reason is that it's, it's kind of hazardous working because she's around a lot of fumes from the burning and that. So that's her justification. And because she's so good at her design work and she's getting those prices. Now, the most I've made, uh, you know, it's nothing like that. I have sold sculptures here and there and I've done, had successes in Burlington at galleries and that. And, but in terms of making a living at it, it's, there's only 16 players on the team. <laughs> Once in a while I might get a commission, but uh, it's mostly been, yeah, the other way. Any other questions? Anybody feel like they want to move metal? Yeah. Uh, how much would it cost if I were to give you a drawing to make a sculpture out of? I would have to see the piece. I would have to see it and tell you. But to, to answer your question about that, um, The sign at the co the cafe sign at the co-op, you know, I thought I was going to make a big score by making that sign bracket because that would give me credit at the co-op for, you know, my work commitment, the Buffalo Mountain Co-op and all about that, right? So I got that sign bracket all made and hung up there and I went to see about my, my credit for my thing. I said, oh, you're a senior citizen, you already have that credit. <laughs> But if I were to look at that bracket, you know, it's the one that holds the cafe sign and put together the time involved, not so much in materials, maybe $30, $40 in materials and probably 10 hours work, so 10 times 33, that's like four or $500. It's like, pfft, what? I mean, it, it, time is money. So I charge 35 and that's not very much. Most people that do blacksmithing around, they get 50 or 60. So it's a hard way to go, but people do do it. I had two homeschoolers who, the fellow wanted to be a snowboarder. He wanted to go out and snowboard. He said, all about snowboarding. Well, they had my course as their history course. And this fellow went out, Aaron Bushy, he went out to uh, Squaw Valley in California because it's a big ski place. And he, he, to be a snowboarder ski bum, and he happened to be looking for work and walking down the street and he saw a fire in this place, he looked in there and it's a blacksmith shop and there's two Austrian brothers who were trained formally. And it's not unlike Stowe, there's a lot of money there where he went. And he got to be their broom boy, having had a little experience at, at my uh, school and ended up now, he's making commission work for $50,000 because he's in a place where there's a lot of money and he's got good design skills and he's got his brother with him and they're making a, a good living at blacksmithing. But that's the exception. That's the exception. So, I would just recommend trades are a good way to go because you've always got a skill you can market. And, uh, you know, the rest of it, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. I know that. Other questions? Well, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to continuing with Jonathan and Zarian. Thank right. you for coming and talking to us. Yeah, thank Go you. Ahead.